So we're back for a third little spot here, and I want to introduce uh, yet another method, another data analysis technique, and it's called Naive Bayes, uh, the Naive Bayes algorithm. And this is a supervised learning algorithm, and it's based upon Bayes' rule. And so the ideas are, uh, again, much like the other ones, they're kind of intuitively appealing, and then, but you can execute them at large scale on your data, and that's what the real power of this stuff is that some of these things are very, uh, they scale very nicely so you can execute them on large data sets and, and get very nice results. Okay, so here's the idea. So naive base. And what we want to do with naive base uh, is we want to start thinking about how to use this and what, what it's going to use is Bayes' rule. So that's the name Bayes in there. And uh, the ideas are kind of simple. Let's consider something where I have two classes, okay? Things can be zero or one, okay? So right away, the fact that I said this and making an assumption means it's a supervised algorithm because I've already said there's two kinds of data in my set. Remember with Gaussian mixtures or k-means, you're trying to even guess how many classes are in your set. But here I said there's two classes, there's zero and one. And what I want to do is decide on a score. How do I score things? And I want to make a score that has really nice separation between these two classes. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to construct a score of the following. I'm going to use some conditional probabilities. I'm going to construct the following ratio. And what it says is, what is the probability of having class 1 given the data x versus what is the probability of being class 0 given x, okay? So this is interesting. So if you're near cluster 1, this here will be near 1, and this, is, and this here will be very close to 0. So something near 1, something close to 0, you're dividing by something very small. This becomes a very big number. Whereas, if you have something that's very near zero, and okay, so that means this is becoming like near one, and this thing here becomes near zero. So this looks very close to zero, so it's either very close to zero or it's very big. Okay, so the idea is by using the ratio, I might be able to get away with um, a very good metric that separates the data in a nice way, okay? And these conditional probabilities are very interesting, right? Uh, the conditional probability statements, you can think about it in terms of, let's say, weather. And you could say, hey, what's the probability uh, that in Seattle um, the temperature will be 70 tomorrow? And it's kind of an ambiguous question, right? Because you might not be able to answer that very well. But I could say, what's the probability that it's going to be 70 degrees tomorrow given that today it was 70 degrees? That's going to influence how you think about the probability or even I could say, what's the, what's the probability of being 70 degrees tomorrow given that it's January 1st? Again, something that will influence your probability. So that's what these conditionals mean, okay? What is the probability of being a one given the data x? Same statement as what's the probability of being 70 degrees given that it's January? Well, it's pretty low, right? Um, so these are the kind of things we can start thinking about. So, here, what's the probability it's 1 given x? What's the probability that it's a 0 given the x? Now, what Bayes' rule says is I can rewrite this as the following. Probability of 1 given x is actually that statement there and here, same from below, which is the probability of 1 given x is the same as the probability uh, of x being a state given uh, given, given, given that it's a 1, okay, uh, times the probability, the probability distribution of a 1, okay? So this is just, this is just the simple use of Bayes' rule. So even if you don't know this Bayes' rule, Bayes' rule is basically this equals these two, okay? Now here's the big deal about this. The big deal about this is that these are actually pretty easy to compute. So if you actually 
have your data samples, you know it's two classes. So for instance, my dog, cat, you have your training data. You can compute these things pretty simply. It's a really naive way to do it, but it, it works. That's why it's called Naive Bayes, and it's very successful, and so it's stuck around. So even though it's such a simple idea, it works out quite well because these things here are quite easy to comp uh, compute. In fact, what's the probability of, of it being uh, a one or a zero? So for instance, even in our cat and dog training data, you could ask from all my data, what's the probability of getting a cat if I just randomly pick? Well, it's 50%. Or what's the probability of picking a dog if I randomly pick? It's also 50%. So these two are trivial to compute. Okay? And, uh, and in fact, you could always say too, like what this allows you to do is to use priors on your, on your information, which is suppose I actually had a thousand pictures of dogs, because I love dogs, and I only have 10 pictures of cats in there in my data file. So then the question is, well, if you pick one randomly, what's the chance it's a dog or a cat? Well, I mean, if I have a thousand dogs and only 10 cats, probability is pretty high, right? My prior on this says that, oh, well, wait a minute, my, if I have so many, my chances are I'm going to get a dog, right? I would almost guess dog just because the probability are in his favors. And you can take that into account with these two metrics right here, okay? So that's going to be the idea of naive base. It's as simple as that. And you can generalize this to multi-classes and multi-features. And uh, we're going to use this in a, in a simple algorithm, uh, just, just like what we have here. Okay, so naive Bayes, main concept, let's apply it to the dog and cats. And again, we are not going to give details on these mathematical methods, that's a different course, uh, but highlight sort of in some sense the intuition behind these methods. So naive Bayes has this really nice intuition which just simply says, look, uh, I know a lot about conditional probabilities, and I know a lot about uh, what's the probability of finding something. You know, again, the, the perfect example is, you know, what is it, what's the probability of, uh, of it being 70 degrees tomorrow, given that yesterday was 70 and the day before was 70. It helps inform your decision. And same thing here, you're going to take that data, say, given all what I know about dogs and cats, what's the probability that this is a dog? Okay. If I'm drawing from a large sample and if I only rarely get a cat, right, that's important. So when I want to guess what something is, I'm probably going to be biased towards the dogs if there's a thousand dogs and ten cats. So this is a method that allows us to sort of in a principled way get to doing this data analysis. All right, so let's go to our MATLAB. And again, the training set's here and the test set's there. And remember the naive Bayes is a supervised algorithm because ahead of time, I'm telling you that there's this many dogs, uh, or there's, I'm telling you the classes, right? There's dogs, there's cats. So I've told you that already, so you already know how many classes you have. All right, so let's go ahead and do the naive base. So let's call this NB. It's gonna work a lot like um, uh, the Gaussian mixture models. What we're gonna get is some output from our training set that's going to give us some a handle on this variable nb, which has all this information about that training set in a naive Bayes framework. Okay, all right. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to need one more variable. I'm going to call it c train. And what c train is going to be is a variable. Uh, because now, remember in the training phase, what we just did Gaussian mixture models. In the Gaussian mixtures, I just said there's two clusters, go find them. I have my training set, I have my test set. And now what C-Train is going to allow me to do is say, label your training data. Okay? And here's how I want to label my training data. First, I want to make a variable, uh, and I can label it any way I want. MATLAB's kind of nice. I can even make categorical variables or strings. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to call dogs ones, cats two. Okay. So first I'm going to make uh, uh, basically it's going to be look like this. I want to make uh, a vector that's going to be uh, ones, and it's going to be a uh, fifty by one. 
Okay, 50 rows, one column, stacked on top of a vector of twos. So what I did is here, say for the C train, there's 50 ones stacked on top of 50 twos. But that's how I arrange my training data, right? I have dogs are the first 50, cats are the next 50. So I've just labeled them. So this is where this idea of, the, of, of, of supervised learning comes in, right? I've labeled my data ones, twos, okay? And you need to do that when you do these training algorithms, right? Because you've got to label it. Your, your trainer has to say, wait a minute, you know what's going on in this. You've, you've given me labeled data, right? So label it for me, and that's what we just did, okay? So now, once you have those labels, then you can go here to NB, say naive, uh, fit, sorry, fit. They just recently changed the command structure for these um, in, a, in a big way in MATLAB between 2014A and 2014B. So many of these commands don't actually work if you have 2014A and below, uh, but has, or has a different way to make them work, different command structure. Okay. Fit, naive Bayes, training data, labeled. That's it. When you do this, it will actually go through and it will, in a principled way, uh, do exactly that algorithm. It'll say, look, I have these two classes. Let me look at what's the probability of class one, what's the probability of class two, what's the conditional probability of, uh, of, of x given class one, or, or uh, of a one given x, and of a, a second class given x, okay? So it can compute these things out. It does so with the training data, because uh, you've labeled it. Right, so I mean, once you've labeled it, it knows like, okay, this is supposed to be a dog. So what's the probability that this, you know, I know it's supposed to be a dog, uh, but my where I am in PCA space, what's the probability I sit there? Well, maybe it's very unlikely. I'm way over here versus I'm sitting in this big cluster around uh, the other dogs. Okay. So NB comes out, and then you can use NB uh, to predict. So now you can say, okay. My prediction is going to be basically NB predict X test. So it's going to take this handle NB, call a predictor, and you just throw your test data in, and what's going to come out is um, a prediction. And what it's going to do for every row of that test data, remember we've taken 30 dogs, 30 cats to test it on. So when you throw those 30 dogs, 30 cats at it, it's going to give you back things that are either ones or twos, because I said they're supposed to be ones or twos. Dogs are ones, cats are twos, and whatever comes out here as a one gets labeled a dog. Whatever comes out as a two it gets labeled a cat. Okay? So we can once again uh, plot a bar of pre. Okay? And there we go. So this is the result of this naive base. In this case, remember in the Gaussian mixture model, it decided to pick one thing called one and one thing called two, right? It just made two clusters and when it did the algorithm, it could have easily picked two to be one and one to be two, but here I've labeled it. I know that a one represents a dog. So the first 30 are supposed to be dogs and you can see I miss one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I get nine out of 30 dogs wrong, okay? So my accuracy, but you know, I mean, depending on how you look at this, I got 21 out of 30 right. Uh, so my probability is, is, is somewhere in the, um, you know, 60 to 70%. For my cats, I only missed two. So by the way, that's one thing we found also with the Gaussian mixture models. Cats seem to be a lot easier uh, to distinguish, and there's a reason why that is, and it's mostly having to do with their ears, uh, because they have the very nice triangular ears. But here, I got almost all of them right. I got 28 out of 30. But ultimately, I aggregate this, and the fact is, remember, you always cross-validate. You can run it again. Every time you run it again, you get different results. Now, in this random shuffle, notice I got one, two, three, four, five, six, something like seven wrong, okay, out of, so, 
Before, you might have had a lot of confidence saying, hey, look, this training algorithm, algorithm works very well for cats. Well, guess what? That was just luck. And from your randomness, uh, from your random draw, you do a random draw again, now you're getting uh, 7 out of 30 wrong. So this is why it's so important, again, to cross-validate, just because all you have to do is run this two times and you're going to see a big difference. Okay, so that is the naive base. Very important method, two lines of code. Here it is. It's that simple. <coughs> Training data, which is labeled, predict. Okay, so you have that available to you now. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something that you can use. You can use this, you can use Gaussian mixture, you can even test them against each other. But this is a supervised algorithm versus Gaussian mixture.